you think might happen next. So if we, if you could tell us a little bit about who he was, what he meant to Hamas, etc. Yeah, um, I, I, I think it, it, it's easy to to start the conversation about Ismail Haniyeh in general, about his history specifically, because I, I, I think we're repeating the same kind of bio for the majority of the Palestinian resistance uh, leaders throughout history, um, whether it's Hamas leaders or Fatah leaders or the PFLP, um, it, leaders have always been assassinated uh, at their peak of their leadership at the uh, times where um, the struggle is in a place where the people are demanding justice, the people are rising against the occupation, Israel feels the need um, to to maintain its uh, dominance over the, the native or the colonized uh, by assassinating the leaders. So Ismail Haniye was born in um, early 1960s, uh, I think 1962. Um, he was the usual um, Gaza guy. He was he was he was born and raised in a refugee camp um, in in Gaza uh, or what is known as Shatik. Uh, it translates to beach. It's uh, one of the refugee camps in Gaza. Uh, he's someone <clears throat> who was born and raised in, uh, in, in mosques, being active in the community. Uh, later on joined, uh, before the creation of Hamas, was involved in Islamic movement uh, uh, in the early days, uh, uh, what we know as the Muslim Brotherhood, as, as many of you know. Hamas was, or is considered the Palestinian version of the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, the kind of independence structurally, uh, even ideologically. Uh, but in the early days, it was very much um, connected to the Muslim bro Brotherhood in Egypt. Uh, he was one of the early, uh, he's not technically considered one of the founders of Hamas, but he's one of the, of the leaders of Hamas movement. Uh, <clears throat> he was involved in the student movement in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, later on, he was uh, the personal kind of assistant secretary of Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, who was the main uh, founder of Hamas, the leader of Hamas until his assassination in 2003. Uh, so he's someone who was born and raised into the movement. He's, uh, he's, a, he's a big name in the movement, um, even though he is being the, the leader of the pol political bureau of Hamas uh, <clears throat> since 2007, specifically all of Hamas. As many of you know, Hamas leadership is divided between the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, <clears throat> uh, and Florian, or the the exterior version of Hamas, meaning that the Hamas lead, Hamas people in in the diaspora, specifically in the Arab region, and the 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 larger um, version of Hamas, which is the political bureau, and that is the leader of Hamas. Uh, Hani before that was in the leader of Hamas in Gaza for, for many years, um, before he, or even after, um, specifically in 2006, when Hamas was, has won the election in Palestine, um, he was uh, sworn in as the prime minister for the Palestinian Authority. Um, of course, that did not last long, as, as we know, the issue of Fatah happened, the division between Hamas and Fatah happened. Um, the siege on Gaza started in 2007, so he didn't really serve well, or was not given the opportunity to serve in the Palestinian Authority. Um, but he was a key figure in the reconciliation between Hamas and Fatah. He's someone who was considered to be uh, the softies in, in Hamas, per se, if, if that's something to, to say. By softies, meaning that someone who's more in a, uh, towards the reconciliation, someone who's even in the 90s, who's one of the people who were, as, as many, Hamas was invited to participate in the parliament election in the, in the 90s, um, but Hamas in general rejected. But he was one of the few people within Hamas that was actually urging Hamas to get involved in the political discussion rather than just the resistance movement. So he's someone who's not just interested in the resistance by itself, but also interested in, 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 in politics and being involved in, in general. So that's a short summary. But again, the majority of Hamas leaders have almost the same CV people who've been active in the community on the grassroots level, being involved in mosques, being involved in the Muslim organizing, and later on develop themselves and becoming leaders in the in the movement. And the one thing to notice or to know about Hamas is that 
with every time you have assassination of leaders, other leaders step up. And Ismail Hani is one of those that stepped up after the assassination of the core founders of Hamas, like Ismail Hani, uh, like Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, uh, Sheikh Rantisi, Dr. Rantisi. Um, Ismail Hani, one of one of the people that stepped up and claimed uh, leadership of Hamas and Gaza for a very long period of time. Um, in terms of where this leads and the implication of it. Um, <clears throat> Historically speaking, the assassination of political leaders, specifically resistance movements, have not been very beneficial or efficient to Israel. Um, and I can give many examples in history if you want me to, um, but there, it, it never worked for Israel. As a matter of fact, if we go back to the 90s, for example, let's take the case of Hamas, for example. In the 90s, Hamas um, or Israel targeted uh, uh, Yahya Ayash, who was an engineer within Al Qassam Brigade, someone who was in charge of the initial days, in early days of the suicide bombings. Um, he was considered uh, the, the top uh, engineer for Hamas or for Qassam and led many operations. Uh, when he was assassinated, Israel felt that it will take Hamas a very long time for them to come up with another engineer to be able to replace him. But in a matter of, of days and weeks, the, he was replaced. Um, and there was used to be uh, what is known as the revenge operations after him uh, that was also very, uh, very strong in response. In the early 2000s, after um, Hamas assassinated Sheikh Ahmed Yassin in 2003, and the assassination of Rantisi one month after him, uh, uh, Sheikh Ahmed Yassin was in March and Rantisi was in April. Many <clears throat> people thought that Hamas would not necessarily collapse, but it would be a huge uh, nightmare for them that would delay them or will stop their growth for, for decades. However, what ended up happening is that <clears throat> Hamas stepped up from the Second Intifada um, into becoming the huge uh, uh, force that they are today. Um, uh, so Israel knows that every time they assassinate a, a, a resistance movement, specifically for Hamas, it, it doesn't really do much. It, it's really, it serves to be a symbolic victory for them um, to, uh, to basically appease their population uh, because anytime Israel is humiliated politically, strategically, or even militarily, um, uh, they end up either killing, as we know, children, as we see today in Gaza, or destroy towns and hospitals and schools and mosques and churches, or assassinate the, the, the leaders of the resistance in hopes that it will, um, uh, uh, it will threaten uh, or deter others from stepping up. Uh, but if anything, history has shown that every single time Hamas is faced with such an obstacle, they come, um, they come uh, up not, I don't want to say victorious, but they come up stronger than before. Um, so in the great scheme of things, I don't think this will change a lot. Yes, it's um, it's devastating for the Palestinian resistance movement. It's devastating for the Palestinians to see one of their one of their leaders is assassinated in Iran uh, at, at these times, uh, specifically after eight, 10 months of Israel not being able to assassinate any leader in Gaza. Uh, and the fact that they were not able to assassinate any leader, even in Qatar or in Turkey, uh, for them to take advantage of Haniya being in Iran to assassinate him is definitely devastating for the Palestinian movement. However, uh, in the grand scheme of things, I don't think it's going to change much. I think Hamas will, uh, these leaders know what was coming. They signed up for this. Um, a few weeks ago, we, we, we've seen Haniya lost the majority of his family. Israel killed his um, sister, his uh, uh, his sons and daughters and their wives and children. And he said it very clearly that the blood of his family is not more valuable than the blood of the rest of the Palestinian uh, murders and victims. So this is something he signed up to. And, and according to Hamas leaders throughout history, they've always said, you know, this is the path they've chosen um, and another leader will step up and carry, carry on. So at the end of the day, I think what Israel is doing today is, again, is, is seeking revenge uh, to appease its people. I think Netanyahu and the Israeli government is realizing that they have not accomplished any of their goals in Gaza at all. Besides destruction, mass murder, uh, there has not been any political gains. There has not been any strategic, strategic gains. So to them, to appease their people um, is essential for them. Um, specifically, as we've seen yesterday after these right to rape protests that have taken over Israel. And I think Israel is trying to curb this division 
by distracting the people by such a big event that is taking place today. Um, yesterday, they, uh, they assassinated uh, a top Hezbollah leader and today a Hamas leader. Hopefully this will change the discourse for them and will unite 